Yeah. Yeah. And but the reason behind it is that they're interested. It's a very good question. They're interested in finding sites that define the whole family in one fashion or another. So either the whole family has global conservation or the whole family has sub-family specific They will miss a lot, and that's the motivation for this next method. That's the person identity. So at this point, that's a very good question that I didn't answer. I didn't actually touch on that's a really good question. So what I want to do is actually let's answer that question. Yeah. 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 That's the same thing. So let's let's take a note here. What is that? I recognize it doesn't need up to the best ones. Uh -huh. But I think it's a, it's a new enough field. 
There might not be ways to benchmark these performances. I don't know. Um, but I would also say that if you're interested in, in statistical modeling and machine learning, you need to pick an area for which there's enough data to actually do something. So there are, there are also really interesting questions that are just as cool but might be more readable. Otherwise, you're like doing it too early. Okay, let's get started. Um, so one of the questions that was raised uh, in the break, which is really handy, and, and thank you very much uh, for asking the question, uh, is for me to explain why at this point in the tree, for the first residue that was found, it was labeled at 30%. This 30% in the evolutionary trace algorithm uh, slides position at the first cut at A as 30%. The reason for that is that 30% in that case represents the percent identity, it's the minimum pairwise identity between any pair of proteins in the whole tree. So if you have two proteins, if you have like human and chimp, and they're both in the tree, they're orthologs, human and chimp could be 100% identical at the protein level or maybe 99% identical. So if they're really close by in the tree, they're likely to be high in pairwise identity. But if you have human and chimp over here, and down here you've got, let's say, fish, or you've got you know, some uh, sea slug, yeah, the pairwise identity between something up here and something down here might be down to 30% identity or lower. Many of the phylogenetic trees that I've built in my life, protein families, have pairwise identities down to 10% or 15% identity in the alignment. That's very distant. So the more distant the sequences that you bring in, then in terms of evolution divergence, then the lower the pairwise identity. And at the root of the tree, the smallest pairwise identity could be very small, down to 10 to 15% identity. But as you take progressive cuts, and your subfamilies that, that are determined by that cut get smaller and smaller and more and more closely related, then your pairwise identity in that cut is going to go up. So here you see 80% pairwise identity. By the point at which they got to this cut, G, all the subtrees that were defined at that point in the tree had 80% identity within each subtree or higher. Got that? So when you're looking at a very diverse set of proteins and you're seeing maybe one or two amino acids that are conserved across the whole family, those residues that are conserved across the whole family may be conserved for structural reasons, as I explained earlier, like my disulfide bridges that the scorpion toxin superfamily has, or they might be conserved for functional reasons, like a catalytic site. So evolutionary trace started at the root of the tree and proceeded from highly diverse groups where only one or two amino acids were conserved and further down. And the closest to the root, that amino acid, that columns showed up in the alignment, showing perfect conservation, um, then that meant they were more important. Now there's another thing that another same student asked was, why would evolutionary trace say in this position, which is a conserved D in this subtree, and it's a variable position in the lower subtree? Similar amino acids, but they're variable. Why would this position not show up at the second cut, 
because it's perfectly conserved in that subtree. And this position, which is perfectly conserved in the upper subtree and perfectly conserved in the lower subtree, why would LJ trace select this position and not this <coughs> position? And that's because Evolutionary Trace was looking for two types of positions. The first type of position is perfectly conserved across the whole family. The second type of position is perfectly conserved within each subfamily. So when you cut the tree into subtrees, for Evolutionary Trace to determine, to decide it's important, that position in the alignment had to be perfectly conserved within every subtree that was defined by that partition. This position was conserved within the two subtrees, but this position is only conserved within this subtree and not within this subtree. And if, for instance, you had a position where it was uh, conserved S and then blanks, just dashes in the other subtree, Evolutionary trace would reject that position also. So having a gap, it could be a perfectly conserved gap, isn't enough for evolutionary trace. So evolutionary trace was looking for two types of positions, family defining, perfect conservation, or perfectly conserved within each subfamily. And anything less than that didn't pass uh, muster. So that limitation of evolutionary trace is one of the limitations of evolutionary trace. It's one of the reasons, one of the motivations uh, for the method that came out of my lab at Berkeley. All right, so there were several methods that came out of my lab at Berkeley. One of them used a, a boosting algorithm, which I'm not describing here at all. It's called ResBoost. Um, but this algorithm, two algorithms shown here, one is called Intrepid, uh, information theoretic traversal for protein functional site identification. Uh, intrepid means fearless in English, um, but that's what it stands for. And it uses evolutionary information only. So sequence conservation patterns over the evolutionary tree. We were trying to get around this problem that uh, the evolutionary trace algorithm had. And the discern algorithm which used intrepid, but also 3D structure information and a statistical modeling technique. Um, for logistic regression for coming up with the model parameters. Earlier, I talked a little bit about model estimation. And I want to take a small digression to say when you build a complex statistical model with many parameters, then you have a problem with tuning those parameters. You need lots of data. So people sometimes ask, how much data do you need for building a statistical model, if, for instance, when we first came up with hidden Markov models, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but the, the lab I was in as an undergraduate uh, in Santa Cruz was a lab that developed hidden Markov models for proteins. So it was the first time they were developed for proteins. And when we first submitted the paper on hidden Markov models for proteins, to uh, the Journal of Molecular Biology. The Journal of Molecular Biology sent it out for review and it came back with, we don't believe you have enough data to tune your hidden Markov model parameters. You have only a few sequences. How can you possibly tune all those parameters? So a hidden Markov model has 20 amino acid probabilities at every position. And the way we built the HMM, there were nine transition probabilities from one state to the next at each position. So 29 parameters at each position and you could have hundreds of columns. So you get thousands of parameters that you have to estimate. And if your data is sparse, if you only have a few sequences, you can't train those model parameters. So this is a, a very good observation. And what they're pointing at is you have a problem with model overfitting. So if your data, if the statistical model is complex, which means it has a lot of parameters, you need lots 
at most overfitting. Model overfitting happens when your statistical model is complex and you don't have enough data for it. So what happens is you fit, it's called model overfitting, because you're going to fit the model to the available data very well, and it won't generalize to something new. So how do you get around that? That's one of the real problems, model overfitting. And there are algorithms for this in machine learning. One of them is called uh, optimal brain damage. That was popular when I was a graduate student. In a neural network, you can prune out some of the connections and improve. That means removing some of the parameters. Some of the connections in the neural network can be removed, and that actually improves the generalization capability. I'm going to show you how that works in this context, because we had to use a technique uh, to get around it. So here's Intrepid. Intrepid was designed with the observation that proteins in a family um, some of them are more interesting to a particular person than others. So for instance, in this family, if you're interested in this protein, you don't really care that the proteins in this group have a conserved S here. That's not going to be informative for your proteins here because they don't have that conservation signal. If you're interested in a protein in this group, you really want to be able to find that this position, that conserved S, is important. So which protein you're interested in defines the part of the tree you want to focus on. So uh, motivation, biologists are interested in a single protein, not the whole family. They need the whole family to tell them something about their protein, but they don't really care what's happening for subfamilies that are some distance away. They really care about more about the proteins that are closer to their protein in the tree. The other observation is not all proteins um, use all positions identically. So for instance, this group has several positions that are perfectly conserved. This position is somewhat variable. But the upper subtree has these, this position is variable, and that position is conserved. That could happen when you have a binding pocket, where the type of, of ligand that is being held in, the, in an enzyme active site has a different shape. So this position might not be important for binding for this group. And this position might be very important for the lower subtree. <clears throat> uh, the other problem is that you can get alignment errors. It's very common to have alignment errors in proteins. You gather enough proteins in the family, structural divergence across the family means that you also have sequence divergence. Sequence divergence means it's hard to get a good alignment. And if you're requiring perfect conservation within each subtree at a position, any alignment errors could cause problems. So we wanted a method that was robust to that problem. Perfectly conserved positions are easy to find, like the D and the G at the beginning of this alignment. Um, positions that are conserved within subfamilies, you need to actually be able to find the subfamilies. If you know that there's a functional change between those two subtrees, you can use that as part of your training information. You can say, I'm interested in residues that will uh, give a change in function between the sequences in that subtree and the sequences in that subtree. If you ask that question, then this position, where it's conserved H changing to conserved K, um, can certainly be highlighted. But typically, you don't have that information, because experimental data are very sparse about function. If you recall the first lecture I gave you, I said that the percent of proteins that had experimental support for their annotations, does anyone remember what that percentage was? What fraction of proteins have experimental support for their gene ontology annotations or for any aspect of their annotation? It was less than 2%. So it's very hard to actually say which functions individual proteins have because you have a lot of errors. 25% of sequences are expected to be misannotated and 30% have no known functions. So typically, you're operating in a state of knowing very little, and you've got to use the sequence information, and if you have 3D structure, the structure information, to give you a way of dividing up a family into subfamilies. All right, so let's say we're interested in sequence S1 at the top and S2. So here's how this algorithm works. We're going to diverse a path uh, 
in, interpret as an information theoretic tree traversal for protein functional site identification. So the tree traversal starts at the root, and we're going to take a path from the root to <coughs> this sequence. And in every point on this path, we're going that will define a cut of the tree into subtrees. So at the root, everything's in one subtree. And then when we get to this point, we're really going to be focusing on only the sequences in this subtree. And then at this point, we're looking at only the sequences in this subtree, and so on. And we can measure the conservation propensity within that <coughs> subtree, um, you know, ignoring what's happening outside of the subtree. And we can use a, a relative entropy function, the standard diversion set, looks at the similarity between the conservation patterns at that position and the background distribution, which is essentially <coughs> uniform. It's close to uniform. And then we find, for every position, the point in the subtree at which the jensen shannon divergence um, was maximized. So this position, the jensen shannon divergence between the position and the background distribution is maximized at this point in the tree because the background distribution here is more noisy. This point here, it's, uh, well this, the D and the G are both maximized here. By the point we get to this point in the tree, we're going to start seeing the H, because it wasn't conserved at that point, but it does come conserved there. So the H and the P would come up in, at this point in the tree. When we get here, we're going to start seeing the, I think it's going to wait till we get to here where we see that the S um, is also conserved. So that's how it works. So those are the residues that will show up at different points in the tree, and they'll all get different scores. And that's convenient, because then you can test your prediction capabilities based on the scores. You can actually do a score-based thresholding for accuracy. All right, but now we want to use also 3D structure information. So for the, um, actually this is still back in the, in the Intrepid validation. So for Intrepid, we compared Intrepid against Evolution Trace from the web server. Another web server at the Tel Aviv University uh, from the concert algorithm. And then for our own multiple sequence alignments, we use the global conservation. Um, so based on an alignment we built from the side blast homologs. Every data set we took, uh, the core protein from the catalytic site atlas that had residues known from experiment <coughs> that they had annotated. We gathered homologs using Cyblast, um, so that's three iterations of Cyblast, um, and um, aligned them using muscle. We built a neighbor joining tree for Intrepid using the Phylox software for the neighbor joining software and web servers for evolution trace and conserve and their default settings. And here is um, these ROC curves, which you're, either you already know about or you're gonna be getting a lecture on at some point this semester. Um, ROC curves, what you really want is something that has uh, very high precision and very high sensitivity. But what you get is uh, just basically poor performance at different points. So when we, one thing we were interested in is if we restrict the um, sequences in our data set to those that are higher in percent identity, our performance degrades. So you want to have the area under the curve be large. So you're going to measure an ROC curve. It's the area under the curve. And when we restricted the percent identity, so the minimum percent identity was 25%, we had reduced performance. When we allowed the percent identity to be very low, unrestricted, we had the best performance. So the interpret algorithm benefits from high sequence divergence. It turns out that many of these other methods don't benefit from high sequence divergence. Their methods may even fail if you give them very highly divergent sequences. You can imagine an evolutionary trace if it requires global conservation across the whole data set. You bring in sequences that maybe get misaligned or they don't have the same residues, it's going to fail. Um, and then we compared um, uh, a different version of Intrepid. I'm going to go past this, but just to point out that precision recall is another way of displaying the same information. And it's a little bit easier to see things sometimes with precision recall. But basically what we see, the Intrepid algorithm um, <coughs> outperformed these other methods. You know, it's a, it's a small but measurable improvement. So the red line is the global conservation just at the root of the tree. 
but down here that is Concert and Baylor College of Medicine. And you can't really see, but this one is Concert here. And there's the ET server here. So there's a dramatic improvement in, um, in precision at lower recalls and some improvement at recall at high. Um, <coughs> essentially, it's, it's kind of, it's not a dramatic improvement, but it's a measurable improvement. So now let's look at what happened when we did discern. So in discern, we wanted to include 3D structure information. Um, but to do so, we had to build a very complex statistical model. So for every position in the molecule, so for instance, let's say here, we took an, uh, essentially a radius around that molecule and looked at the 10 closest positions for the side chains. This is a little bit related to the, um, the Baylor cult, sorry, the UCLA method for the 3D structural conservation uh, that I showed you earlier, where they looked at a, a region around each site to look at the structural and sequence conservation. So we're going to have a statistical model that has many different features for every position in the structure. So this requires a 3D structure. The Intrepid algorithm did not require a 3D structure, but also didn't use information from the structure. The CERN algorithm requires a 3D structure. So we're going to take for every position in the molecule, we're going to have um, 11 different sites that we're going to draw information from. The rest, center residue that we're interested in and the 10 closest sites. We have 11 different sites for each position that we're interested in, and we're going to draw information about solvent accessibility, um, if it's on a helix or a strand or a loop, what residue is found there, um, how conserved that residue is across the family, the intrepid spore, and so on. So we have many, many features, and to get around this problem with model uh, complexity and model overfitting, we're using logistic regression with L1 regularization to reduce the model complexity. Yeah. And how do you select uh, residue of interest? We're going to do this for every single residue in the protein. Uh, okay. So if you have 300 residue in the protein, you're going to get a spore for every single residue. A lot of <coughs> So every residue has... You character every residue and rank them. You do that. That's right. You're going to give right. every residue a spore yeah. based on this complex model. And then you can sort the residues by that spore. Okay. And you can say, we're going to give, you know, the strongest probability of catalysticity is for the ones that have the highest scores. Okay. And then the scores, if they go down, the probability of catalysticity drops. Mm. But let me go into this a little bit more. So here's logistic regression. I'm going to let you look at this independently because we're not going to have time to talk <coughs> about it. But basically, you're training the model parameters in logistic regression to fit the data. And we did this tenfold cross-validation. So we're training on some part of the data, and then we're going to test it on the withheld data. And then we're going to retrain the model parameters from a tabula rasa again and test it on the withheld data. And then we iterate that process. So here's an example for one protein. We take one 3D structure from the catalytic side atlas, and we gather homologs, and we build a tree, and we run Intrepid. Then for every site in this molecule, we have a bunch of features. So we have what residue is present at that site, how conserved that site is according to Intrepid, if it's in a pocket that's based on a, a structure analysis tool, and so on. So there's many different types of features. And then we have a label. The training data tells us, is a residue catalytic or is it not catalytic? So if the catalytic site atlas lists a residue in its database as catalytic, we say, yes, it's catalytic. If the catalytic site atlas doesn't list a residue as catalytic, we say it's not catalytic. We don't say it's unknown. We say it's not catalytic. And this is important when you consider the catalytic site atlas is limited, and there are things it doesn't know about. But basically, every residue is labeled in the catalytic site atlas as catalytic, and everything that's not listed is, by definition, not catalytic, even though it might, in fact, be catalytic. That's how it's treated. Then you do your parameter estimation, and then you uh, compute for every residue uh, in the protein, whether it's catalytic or not. And then you use the performance, if it's correct or not, to revise your model parameters. And this iterates until your model parameters settle. And then eventually, you're going to then get your performance measure out of it. And then you go and you retrain your model, wiping the slate clean on the next part of the benchmark data set. 
And you can do this for all the hundreds of proteins in the benchmark <coughs> data set. Then when you have a new enzyme, then at some point your parameters stabilize. You pick the parameters, maybe you retrain your model on the entire data set, that's one option. Now you're gonna pick a new protein that some user sitting maybe in Amsterdam goes to a website that you developed and says, I want to predict whether or not this protein is, has any catalytic residues, and if so, where are they? That protein is submitted, you gather homologs and build a tree and, and do all of this, and then you run it through the evaluation procedure, and then you're gonna predict which residues are catalytic, and you give them scores. So that's basically how it works. And so the data we used to train were 140 enzymes from the CATRES data set. CATRES is a, a subset of the catalytic side of this. Um, and we filtered the data set, um, the original data set, to remove homologs that could be detected using a blast. So that gave us the 140. Um, also, no two sequences from the same SCOP family. We allowed superfamily homologs to be retained as long as they weren't detectable with BLAST. And then we did tenfold cross validation. Then for every protein, we gathered homologs using side blast at least four iterations, not three, but a pretty conservative cutoff. And then we constructed an alignment using muscle. So that's the uh, benchmarking. And these are the features that were determined for structural neighbors. So for position, this is money, the 3D cluster analysis, for position the molecule will take the 10 plus the structural neighbors. We considered uh, sequence conservation features. So for every position that gives you a number of positions in the alignment, we consider, we did Intrepid with the jensen shen diversions, Intrepid with log odds formulation, which is different, or global jensen shen diversions just at the root of the tree. Amino acid properties, charged, polar, or hydrophobic, and then the tiny amino acid side chain. Structure-based features, B factor, residue centrality, which means how close is it to the center of the molecule. That's gonna come up again, so keep that in mind. Uh, secondary structure, alpha helix, beta, bridge, strand, etc. There's several different types of secondary structures that we consider. Relative solvent accessibility, absolute solvent accessibility, and the presence in one of the three largest pockets. So those are the main features. So you see there's a lot of features. And every one of the 10 structural neighbors has those features computed. And you have hundreds of features. So you have lots of parameters in your statistical model and potentially very sparse data. So the features that were selected by the certain predictor for the central residue, uh, it was, that's the one we're trying to predict, is it catalytic or not? It was really important that it not be hydrophobic. So when you train your logistic regression, the, um, the magnitude of the parameter weight tells you how important that parameter is. And if it's negative, it means that feature is anti-correlated. So hydrophobicity is anti-correlated if it has a negative weight. Centrality, which is how close it is to the center of the molecule, has uh, the largest positive weight. And that's really curious, because remember we were talking about solvent accessibility. So how do you have a pro how do you have a side chain be solvent accessible if it's at the center of the molecule? So that's that's odd. So think about that. Um, charged is also very highly correlated. Then intrepid log odds, intrepid Jensen Shen divergence, uh, those had the next you know the very strong conservation scores. Whether it was cysteine that was also correlated. Relative solvent accessibility and uh, for the entire. Um, rescue or the side chain, uh, histidine was correlated. So these are the features for the central residue. For neighboring residues, if there was a neighboring residue that was histidine, that was correlated. A structurally proximal histidine was correlated with the residue that you were interested in being uh, catalytic. And then intrepid log odds, that means that the residues in the vicinity are also have high sequence conservation. Anti-correlated, having a leucine nearby was anti-correlated with catalytic. So it's interesting to look at that, but I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, well, so hold on a second, you know, don't we know that catalytic residues are found in clefts? And I don't see that here. It's one of the features that we consider <coughs> is that it's in cleft, but in a cleft isn't showing up in these features. So how do you explain that? Does anyone have an idea? Let me remind you, here's the clue. 
the parameter estimation process, especially when you use a, um, a model sparsification technique that tries to reduce the number of parameters that you're going to retain to avoid model overfitting. Remember, the complexity of a model is the number of parameters you have to tune. It tries to remove any parameters that um, aren't actually helping. So you have the fewest number of parameters, and they all should be relatively orthogonal, distinct, but they should give you what you want, somehow in combination. So being in a cleft is absent, so being in a cleft must have been one of the parameters that was somehow dropped. So how do we explain that? Yeah. Because of every data you put in, if inside, it's uh, all local and in cleft, so it's like a uniform distribution? That's not true. Not every residue is in a cleft, because we're going to be predicting for every residue in the protein whether or not it's palytic. So some residues are in clefts and some residues yeah, are not in clefts. Okay. So it's just the residues that are labeled by palytic side atlas as uh, palytic that are typically in clefts. But all the other residues we're actually training our model on. No. So anyone have an idea of how? Yeah. Maybe it's incorporated in some Ah, very good. So you're getting really close. It's not residue centrality that's enough. The, the answer was maybe if a residue is central, it's in a cleft. You need one more feature to add to centrality in order to be in a cleft. And what's that feature? Hydrophilic. Not quite, but solvent accessibility. All right, so if you have solvent accessibility and you're in a cleft, I mean, if you have solvent accessibility and you're toward the center of the molecule, you've got to have a cleft. Otherwise, how is the solvent going to get in? So it's those two features that were retained. Really good, I'm glad you got that. Those two features that were retained that we're able to replace this specific representation of being in cleft. So that's really cool. And we didn't expect that. But that's, in fact, what came out. So it's one of the beauties of this statistical sparsification technique, we did L1 regularization, that kept the parameters that we needed. All right, so that was interesting. And now we compared discern against intrepid and conserve, and here against uh, Elgin Trace. So here this was. This is, CAVRES was a harder data set than just the plain CSA data set. We took both of these data sets, and for the CSA, we also did Edelshank Trace. So here, these are precision recall. So typically, you want high precision and high recall, but you always have this trade-off. You have high recall and low precision, or you have high precision and low recall. But at every point in this curve, the discern algorithm did much better than intrepid and better than conserve. The now, these are just methods that use just sequence information, right? So now here we're comparing against method. Evolutionary trace also uses the structure information. Evolutionary trace is, you can't actually see, but it's this kind of light blue. There's evolutionary trace down here. Evolutionary trace is a little bit better than conserve, but not as good as intrepid. And intrepid didn't even use structure information. but. Uh, discern actually did much better than all of them. So we were, of course, very happy with that, and uh, that got us a very nice publication. Um, but we then looked at statistical models that actually explicitly use, so can, the evolutionary trace web server, even though it says it's using entropy, I don't think it's doing so in a very elegant way. It says it's using 3D structure, but it's not really using them in this very integrated way. So then we went and compared against these two methods, um, one from Janet Thornton's lab, and Janet Thornton is the grand dame. You should all know her, because she's part of the EU, at least for the next month or so. <laughs> um, but uh, she was like the head of the Catholic Site Atlas. So her lab came up with a method with a neural network, that's this blue, that's right here. And then there's a support vector machine from Sean Mooney's lab, and these are two you know, support vector machines are a very elegant, powerful approach in machine learning. And, and they use the same type of information as discern. They're using structure information, they're using evolutionary information, but they're not using our way of getting evolution information. And their statistical modeling technique, it did have a statistical sparsification technique, but not the same one. But if you look at their report, so in fact, here we have another problem with benchmarking methods, because we had to take their self-reported performance on the data set, but we don't know exactly what version. They used Kellex Side Atlas. We don't know exactly what version they used, and they didn't show the whole curve. They just reported these points 
At this point of precision, they had that recall. So that's what we're plotting here, is that precision recall balance. But here you can still see that, for instance, the SVM method from Sean Mooney's lab was very similar to our control, which was, uh, I hope it's on the next slides, but it, it didn't use the evolutionary tree in the same way, and it didn't use structure the same way. Um, so it, it's kind of a hobble version of our method. And uh, there's the Janet Thornton's method, which is like at the level of Intrepid. So we're still really outperforming the best methods that use the same type of information. So the question is, why did that happen? So here's our control um, versus uh, method one, method two, and discern. So discern uses structural neighbors. It uses intrepid. It uses L1 regularization. And at 50% precision, at 50% recall, we get 27% precision. Um, at 18% um, precision, we get 69% recall. The, con the control did not use structural neighbors, so it's looking at an individual site but not bringing in information from other sites. It does not use intrepid, it just uses the global conservation at the, at the root of the tree. It does not use L1 regularization. It doesn't have a lot of parameters to tune, so it probably doesn't need L1 regularization. And here at 50% recall, it has 17% precision. So this go from the control, we're going to step through these. We're getting a much better performance of control. But let's just look at method one. Method one, we added Intrepid to the control. We had a really nice improvement in both precision and recall, just from adding Intrepid. So that's nice. Method two, we added structural neighbors to method one, but we're not using L1 regularization. Now look what happens. When we add the features for structural neighbors, we have a jump in the model complexity, and the precision drops, and the recall drops. So you might think having more, more parameters in your statistical model is better, because you're bringing in more data, but in fact, you're not actually bringing in more data, you're just bringing in more parameters. So you have this model overfitting. This is what it looks like. You can't perform well on new sequences, on new data. So you get a drop in both precision and recall. And as soon as we added in the L1 regularization, we had a big jump in both precision and recall. So this is an example of why this statistical sparsification techniques is really important. You want to have all the possible features that are relevant, but when you do that, if you don't have statistical sparsification, you're going to have uh, degrading of your model performance. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and you, it's part of your recommended reading. You might want to read it like at the end of the year when it's you know, less of a burden for you. But um, this is uh, one of my favorite methods that came out of my lab. So here's an example in our benchmarking. Uh, we did disrepid, uh, sorry, discerned intrepid concert and ET on a couple of case studies. So this is an asparagine synthetase. Um, and these red residues are the, were labeled as catalytic in the catalytic side atlas. This were found by discern, um, but they weren't listed in the catalytic side atlas. Uh, intrepid had more so-called false positives than discern. Concert had many more false positives. Evolutionary trace had many more false positives. But false positives in quotes, because we don't know if the catalytic side atlas is complete. And I did a lot of work looking in the literature for these residues to see was there any evidence for the residues that we were predicting as being important, actually being functionally important. And I found papers for virtually all of those residues where someone had tested that residue or homologous sites in other proteins and shown that they were really functionally important. So that suggested that the catalytic side atlas was just limited and that, in fact, our method was doing very well. It wasn't making mistakes in its predictions. It's just that the benchmark data sets uh, were limited. And I just, this morning, went to the catalytic side atlas and looked up what it had to say about that protein. And um, the, if you go back here, these are the residues uh, that the CSA said were important, D46, R100, and Q116. Um, and that's these three. And these two have now shown up 
in the catalytic side atlas as being involved in the catalytic function. They weren't there when we wrote the paper some years back, and now they're there. So it's one of the things that you just need to know about when you're developing a method that the benchmark data sets um, are not complete. And we looked in detail at all of these residues, and just to say I looked at all these residues and did the work. It'd be really handy to have uh, a way of linking these this information to your protein automatically so that your students and your grad students and or the, or the PI doesn't have to be doing the work to figure it out. Uh, limitations of benchmark data sets, these are the last two slides. I'm gonna let you out at quarter two as I should have done last time. Um, the CSA is the standard benchmark data set um, for catalytic site prediction, and there are not extensive data sets for other types of residuations like allosteric sites, protein-protein interaction interfaces, uh, specificity determines cofactor binding. We don't have good benchmark data sets for those tasks, which is why most machine learning people are going to be focusing on the other problem. All these data sets suffer from limitations. Um, they can have just missing information. Um, this is the last summary slide. Uh, it's specifically about catalytic site prediction. So catalytic residues have certain characteristics. Um, the active site may include hydrophobic residues, which are important for expelling water from that pocket. Um, specificity determinants may be conserved within subfamilies, but may not even be completely conserved within subfamilies across the whole family. The main types of information that you want to use are, are these. And all of the web service databases and tools um, that you might use have limitations. And if you're going to be working on protein function prediction or trying to predict functional sites, um, you actually need to be able to do these things uh, on your own because the methods themselves have limitations. So now we have time for questions. Um, there was at least one question earlier that I didn't get to. And I'm happy to take questions in our last five minutes. So are there any questions? Yeah. yeah, but it's like a technical term. Did you, did you ever try to use your same data input and use a different machine learning method? If like a VM or neural network? We didn't try, we did actually um, implement for the same data sets other machine learning methods. So I used a boosting algorithm, the, the XG, boost algorithm. XG boosting? Or Sorry? XG boosting or gradient boosting? It was, it was an, the Ada boost algorithm. Okay. So we used boosting, that was a collaboration with uh, Yoav Freund. Uh, and the method is called ResBoost. Yeah. Um, and that performed well, but not as well as okay. this. Yeah, and it's um, very hard to interpret. So the, the question is, did we try other machine learning methods? We also <laughs> tried uh, like a, other ways of using the 3D structure information, which gave similar results. Mm -hmm. But we didn't end up publishing that method. <clears throat> um, there are you know, lots of reasons for not publishing methods, and one of which is you just don't have enough time. But we did test other methods, and um, these are the ones that performed, the ones I presented today are the ones that performed the best. Uh, yeah? So, uh, is this being used for enzymes and like detecting the functional sites? Well, we did, so the question is, is this method being used for enzymes? Yeah, can you use it for other? Oh yeah, you can use, so the this method, this algorithm, this approach, can be used for any type of molecule, not just enzymes. So that's what's, that's, I'm glad you asked that question because one of the things that we showed in the benchmarking is that um, the discern algorithm, because it's using Intrepid in particular, um, is able to give strong scores to residues that are near the active site itself, but not specifically at the site residues. And it can find the subfamily specific types of patterns. If you are interested in residues that are away from the active site, such as the protein-protein interaction interfaces, then uh, the intrepid algorithm would be better. Um, we were very interested in allosteric sites, which are far away from the active site, and I found them with discern. And I also found them with intrepid. But they tend to be drowned out by the, the stronger scores that are given to the residues that really fit the statistical model? That's a good question. Yeah? 
So the first question is, what if you use another way of getting the evolution information from the multiple sequence plot in the tree, but not intrepid? So that effectively is what uh, uh, evolutionary trace and concert both do. They're both using the evolutionary tree, but they're not using intrepid. It's not a direct comparison because those methods typically restrict the data that they analyze to closer homologs. So they they have lower they have higher person identities in their data sets. So it's it's hard to do a direct comparison with the effectiveness of the algorithm because the data collection part of their algorithm was different. Do you understand what I mean by that? see if I understand. Um, so in the last minute that we have, um, the intrepid algorithm, we can go to 10 minutes too. Yeah, that clock's fast. That clock's fast. Oh, well, then you can just tell me two minutes and my two minutes are up. The intrepid algorithm that we implemented, um, so the algorithm that's once you have the alignment in the tree and then you run intrepid, the running intrepid part, I think, is correct. But how you cluster the sequences, how you align them, and how you build the tree, those are all things that you should do differently than how you did it. So the way we did it, um, we aligned the full-length proteins uh, with muscle. And you really want to crop the proteins that you've retrieved with Cyblast um, because they, have, they might have very different domain architectures, and then the alignments get weird. And then probably instead of running muscle, we should have run MAP, which is, I think, a better algorithm. And it's just as fast, but it has better results on variable sequences. And then for the phylogenetic tree, probably we would have wanted to have a maximum likelihood tree, maybe not the distance tree that we were getting out of phylogenetic. So there's all of those questions. Is that kind of what you were asking, like how you get the tree? Well, we did that actually. So one of the so for the discerned algorithm, we had several different features for conservation patterns. One of them was the global conservation across the whole family. So that's not intrepid. Um, that's just across the whole family. What are the conservation patterns? Ignoring the tree. Um, one was intrepid with the Jensen Shannon divergence. One was intrepid with the log odds function, a totally different version. We used all of these, and all of them were options to the discern algorithm, which was then able to give them weights and combine them. So if you're training a statistical model, you can use very you can use features that are very closely related, they're correlated features, but the statistical sparsification technique will prune out the ones that are redundant and retain the ones that are more informative um, used in combination. So does that answer your question? Okay, finally. It's easy to misunderstand a question. <laughs> Finally, we got to it. Um, yeah. Um, so for example, you know, when you were talking about plants, and how it was kind of encoded in the centralized version, so of this is the version. Is there a way to trace back uh, which parameters contribute to which others, which are true? Oh, yeah. I don't know if there's really a way to trace that. That's very, so the question is, um, presence in a cleft, we know from all the biological data, it's one of the hallmarks of enzyme acrocyte. And it was really puzzling that discern dropped that. And, and it was actually, I can't tell you that there's any kind of diagnostic procedure that told us that it's the presence in the cleft is encoded by these two features. This is me looking at it, saying, oh, it must be these two features. Because if you have residue centrality and you have solvent accessibility, the only way to do that is if you have a cleft. But the question was, is there a way of looking at all the features that you know are important and somehow figuring out which of the retained features give you that feature? There might be a way of doing that, but I actually don't know how one would do that. So it's just at this point human intelligence or guesswork that tells you that.
But what it speaks to, and maybe this is a good place to end, is when you're building a statistical model, you know, there, there's deep learning and people say, oh, you don't need to have anything. All you do is have deep learning and it solves all your problems. I disagree with that statement. I see one person who agrees with my disagreement. I disagree with that statement for at least the following reasons. One is that it takes a human being who knows something about the domain area, the application area, to say, these are the features you need to consider. You have to include these features. As a human being, you have to say, these are the features that need to go into the statistical model for it to consider. If, if we didn't put residue centrality on the list of features to measure, it would not have been in the features that the algorithm had to crunch. So you need to put all the features in. And you need to not worry about redundant features, because you don't know which features are going to be more useful. So you put all the features in. And then you need to have your model statistical sparsification that will actually prune it up. And then you need to have a way of understanding the benchmark data set issues so that you don't, um, you don't chastise yourself and think you're doing poorly when, in fact, you're discovering things that are actually biologically relevant. But that means you have to understand enough biology in order to make sense of that. So I think for most of you, you've got a lot of biology. And maybe what's a little bit missing, which is why you're in this uh, program, is the computer science um, and the algorithms. So I, I hope today helped bring some of those concepts together in a way that wasn't too overwhelming. And thanks a lot.